Welcome back, everyone, to our third and uh, final video. Uh, we've been doing uh, a follow-up Q&A with uh, Francesca Ferrando. Thank you, Francesca, for your uh, time and generosity. Um, there have been so many wonderful questions. We're, we're really trying to answer as many as possible, uh, but I'm afraid we won't be able to get to all of them. Um, our final, um, third and final um, video today is um, on uh, the environment. And I have, um, we have two questions for uh, Francesca on the topic of the environment. And oh, oh, the first question, um, I, I snuck in my own question. I hope that's okay. Um, so I have a question about, um, a discussion uh, there's been um, a lot of it lately about um, human extinction so on the one hand about um, existential risks to humanity about preventing human extinction or even transcending extinction through technology but also on the other hand there's also been a discussion about seizing uh, to reproduct um, about opting for a, a conscious uh, self-extinction as Patricia McCormack argues and in your book, Francesca, you take uh, an unequivocal position on this when you write that, quote, from a posthumanist existential perspective, extinction is not the answer. So my question for you is, why is that so? Why uh, in our sixth max mass extinction is the human uh, worth saving? And what about the human um, in relation to other species makes it worthy of uh, survival? So our final question. Um, there are very uh, important but delicate conversations still to be had um, about the do as I say, not as I do of academia. But specifically when it comes to emerging fields like the environmental humanities, for instance, we run the risk of perpetuating what you call um, in your book, uh, philosophical greenwashing. Uh, one of the questions is by Anna Cunha, who asks if you could expand on what you mean by this, by philosophical greenwashing. Um, and I would add to, to the question, how can we as academics, as posthumanists, live by uh, what we preach? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Manuel, for uh, bringing these important questions. And thank you for your own question, which I'm going to be addressing first to then talk about philosophical greenwashing. I would actually like to mention that I have a whole uh, um, sub uh, part of uh, chapter number two, specifically on this important question that uh, Manuel is asking, it's called with or without humans. And I talk about uh, specifically about the possibility uh, that some people uh, wish to happen of uh, conscious extinction. Specifically, I'm thinking of uh, uh, philosopher Patricia McCormack and uh, their uh, A Human Manifesto. I would like to say that uh, as a philosophical posthumanist, my answer to the current uh, crisis is neither a technological solution, which is very much a transhumanist end, uh, don't worry, technology will take care of things. Uh, don't worry, let's keep doing what we are doing. Uh, technology, we will find a te technological solution. This is a very much of a transhumanist answer to uh, the ecological crisis. Uh, almost, uh, if you want, uh, in the history of the religion, now that God is dead, according to many atheistic groups within transhumanism, not all are atheists, but more, many are, and now that God is dead, now we have technology. Now technology will save us all. Now that uh, some people do no longer believe in specific human prophets, now we have uh, uh, algorithmic uh, predestination, now we have the high-tech prophecy. So there is this tendency within the transhumanist movement to delegate our own salvation to technology. And when I say technology, I want to say technology in this generic uh, way because the answer is always pretty generic. This uh, super advanced AI, this program, this something that is not here yet, but will probably most likely happen. So do not worry, just have faith, blind faith in technology. I am not the kind of thinker 
I think the technology is not separated from us, so the technology by itself cannot be the savior to a lost species. On the other side, I also don't agree with, uh, for instance, uh, the approach, well, if we, these uh, species that, uh, according to some, is becoming a cancer to our own planet, uh, if we get extinct, then everything is going to find some type of balance, because at the moment, humans are really causing ecological disbalance. And so some people, like, for instance, Patricia McCormack is saying, well, why don't we get extinct? Uh, it is important to clarify here that, for instance, uh, McCormack position as many of these approach, they are not anti-human. So it's not that they want to kill or destroy the humans who are alive. I want to clarify this because sometimes there is a misunderstanding. Oh, they are just, they hate humanity. They don't. At least I can say about this specific uh, flavor of the anti-human. I'm sure that there are some that may, but that's not who I'm talking about now. Uh, according to this uh, approach, uh, the a human, for instance, with uh, Patricia McCoy, Patricia McCoy is not saying that we should destroy in any way the humans that are around here right now, but that we should not procreate. So eventually, if no one procreates, then you go to a kind of natural and joyful, she talks about enjoying our life, extinction of the human species. I am not one of those thinkers because I uh, believe that we are not separated from everything else. I don't believe that if we get extinct, other species, uh, we can talk about, uh, you know, species that are around right now, they're doing very well, for instance, in cities are cockroaches that have nothing against, uh, or, uh, or mice, or birds, or uh, uh, seagulls, or, uh, or deers, or, or lions, where lions are almost extinct, but whichever animal is around, I don't think that they all of a sudden are going to master it. Uh, that now, you know, like they, we have lost the supremacy, or maybe even if there is no supremacy, if our own energies are still entangled in this mis existential misunderstanding of who we are, then the same issues are going to be repeated by, for instance, AI, who now is going to think that, oh, now the humans are out, now we are going to take over, and now we are in charge. I think that the problem here is not so much who is in charge, but is this deconstructing this dichotomy of the self versus the other. So if we remember who we truly are, there is no way we can go on the way we are at the moment as a species. So some people will say, well, what about procreation? Because if every human is having, you know, eight to 10 children, then there is really no escape. I would say that it is hard to generalize. I can say that uh, for some people, uh, probably one child is more than enough. Uh, and for some people, zero children, you know, might be okay. And for some people, you know, eight children are not enough. I'm not the one who tell who should procreate because unfortunately I am very aware of the violent history of eugenics. And in the history of eugenics, some human dictated on others who should procreate and who should not. And I do not want to repeat that history because it's a cruel history, it's a miserable history. But I want to say that, of course, once we realize that we are part of this planet, and yes, if everyone procreated, you know, like nonstop, there would be no space for, for no one. It would be, it, there would be literally the end of the species. There would be just not enough resources. So for instance, I can talk about my own uh, situation and I don't want to generalize. But uh, in my case, uh, for many years, I was not interested, for instance, in, in procreation. I was absolutely not interested. I was fascinated about other uh, dreams of my life. I really wanted to, uh, to go everywhere if I could in the world and know all human beings and, and, and live with them and discover their cultures and eat their food and, and walk to the top of the mountains and write and, uh, and, and play music and, uh, and do uh, you know, sh theater shows in the streets of Guatemala, everything. And when I, um, when I became more of an adult, I started uh, to realize that I, I did want that experience. I did want to have uh, the experience of being a parent. I really felt it very clearly. It was not, uh, no one imposed on me. My parents never asked me if I was going to have a child, children or not. They were very neutral about that. Uh, my companion, you know, we were in this art journey together. No one put on me. I was an anarchist. I didn't believe in those imposition of my society. No one asked me to have a child. 
I wanted eventually to have the experience of having a child or being a child. And I don't have a child. I am a child with my child of being a parent, of experiencing life from those eyes, of having the biological experience of, uh, of, of, of procreation, regeneration. And, and of course, I was a posthumanist already because I, I waited. I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, when I was young, I didn't want to have children. It was not in my interest. I waited. And um, as a posthumanist, I asked myself, well, there are a lot of humans. And, uh, and how do I feel comfortable having to listen to myself but also being aware of where we are, where we are at as a society. And I'm only going to give my own answer that I do not want to generalize for anyone, but I want to tell that my personal experience and the personal is political, my personal experience as a posthumanist who wanted to, to have a child, who wanted to become a parent. I, I really thought about it. I meditated a lot. I, I took my time and I, I realized that I was going to have a child with another person who really wanted to have a child too, that it was been my, my companion for a long time at the point. And both of us started to really feel, neither of us, you know, had this, this strong call until it happened. And then both of us were like, it is time. This is what's happening. And, um, and in my case, uh, I had to talk with my own consciousness about, you know, what about ecological distress? And I, I thought, you know, it is very important to me. It is part of my mission. It is part, very important for my partner. And we are two, and, and I am, you know, out of two human beings, there is going to be one. I, I was absolutely at peace with having one child. I, I always loved the idea of, uh, of adoption. I may adopt uh, some children in the future. Uh, I never really felt the call to have one, but I always felt uh, really beautiful about uh, maybe helping some children who maybe want to, or would like to have uh, more of a family if they don't have one for different reasons. So I felt, you know, at peace with myself uh, saying as a human, going through this experience that everyone who is alive is the result of that i wanted to have this experience i wanted to experience what does it mean to 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 be with a young child uh, what does it mean to to be a parent and, and i also you know thought also more with my intellectual mind with my academic mind with my with my ecologically aware mind i have here two human beings who are going to create one and so we are diminishing the species. We're not expanding. I'm, I know that, you know, I have, I know people who have eight children and, and maybe they will have another one. And I, I don't want to judge them. I want to say that that is their journey. It is their journey. It's not for me to judge anyone. But I said that in my case, uh, my own uh, ecological consciousness about it and my own personal vision uh, had to be combined. I had to respect not only my call, but also me being part of a species. And so I would personally, in this lifetime, not having myself many children, although I would like to adopt uh, some children, and that is still very much a possibility. Uh, so I would say that um, it is a personal journey in which, to me, it is very beautiful to be aware at very different levels, not just about what is happening in the moment, you know, ah, wow, I'm pregnant again and not just doing maybe what I'm expected to do, uh, having another child maybe because of family position or having no children at all because now my friend, then my philosophers are going to judge me, uh, friends, you know? I would say that you need to listen to yourself because you, you are that, you are that. And we are going to talk about this in, in, with my second answer to this important question um, because there is also a philosophical aspect here. So the question is, how can I get extinct if I have, if I am everything, if I am everything, and this is, for instance, non-dual Advaita Vedanta, uh, the, the notion of, of non-self already in Buddhism, uh, if there is already non-self, how can you get extinct? Or if you are everything, going to the opposite, which is the same, is a cycle, if you're everything, how can you get extinct? In fact, you cannot. Uh, you can only transform yourself until you realize that you are everything, and that is the final extinction, if you want. It's almost the enlightenment in Buddhist tradition, is the moksha in Hinduist tradition. That is the final real extinction of the individual self. But that is a journey. It's not by extinguishing my biological species that I am reaching that. Because if I, extinct, I, I get my biological species extinct, but if the same intention is, is the same misunderstanding was part of the species, 
is all around us, is in the technology that we are developing, is in the way we are, uh, you know, we are treating each other. Those are our waves of energy that we are manifesting. So instead of thinking of us as just individuals or as just nations or as just a species, we can think of us as being really part of this whole dimensional realm. And at that point, there is no way you can get extinct just by extinguishing a specific species. Uh, if you are not working with those uh, entanglements, with those uh, intentions, with those misunderstandings that we are nourishing in this existential obfuscation that on some level, many societies are uh, okay with. And that it can be also be a choice. I uh, lastly want to say that it can be a choice to be playing the game that we do not want to play. If this is a game, if this is Lila, the cosmic game, I can decide to play a game that I don't like. For instance, some people like to watch horror movies. Why would someone like to watch horror movies? And many people do because it's intense, because it gives you a lot of adrenaline, and a lot of emotions. So we can play games that consciously or maybe uh, at the more superficial level, we think we don't want to play. Uh, and the play of extinction, it is a possible game. It is not a specific game I'm interested in. I am more interested in the transformation of the self by really understanding who we are. And at the point when we truly understand who we are, there is no need for the biological extinction of the human. Thank you, Francesca. This takes us to our um, final question. Um, about uh, these very important but also delicate conversations that we still need to have about uh, do as I say, not as I do um, of the university, and specifically uh, in fields like the environmental humanities, in which we run the risk of perpetuating philosophical greenwashing. Um, and Acuna has a question about this. Um, so she's asking, um, if you could expand on what you mean by this, by philosophical greenwashing. Um, and I'm adding to uh, Anna's, Anna's uh, question about uh, to ask how can we, as academics, as posthumanists, um, how can we live by uh, what we preach, so to speak? Thank you so much, uh, uh, Manuel, and thank you so much. Can you repeat the name of the person who is posing this question? Yes, Anna, first name Anna. Anna. Thank Bye. you so much, Anna. Excellent. I want to, um, just a little note, uh, because we are uh, in the Q&A of the book launch of uh, The Art of Being Posthuman. It is being released uh, one week, actually five days ago. And there is a section that if you want to look a little more into philosophical greenwashing, page 74 and 75 of meditation number four. So here you can really go a little more deeply into what I mean by philosophical greenwashing and why I thought that it was very important to have actually a whole section about it. And I want to answer this question because I've been in academia uh, on and off for uh, more than 20 years. Uh, let me think about it, Tw yeah, uh, 24 years. And I, um, I entered the academia very consciously. I really wanted to be in academia uh, to, uh, to nourish a specific way of uh, writing and a way of expressing my voice. And I found in academia an incredible community of people who were able not only to uh, hear my voice, but to support my vision and to help me understanding more about why uh, that felt so important to me. So I studied the, the history of humankind and so many philosophers and anthropologists and artists by creating their work and writing helped me understand who I am. So I am very grateful about the history of academia, about uh, the professors, amazing professors that I had, uh, the philosophers that I studied, the students that, that I have now. So I'm really grateful to academia. Uh, and of course, as when you're part of something, you can always also see aspects that can uh, can change. And I've been realizing that uh, although academia starts from a spe specific actually philosophy, I'm a philosopher. So if you think of uh, the history of philosophy, uh, the meaning of the term philosophy, which comes uh, uh, out of ancient Greece, but this notion can be really applied to all ancient philosophies from India to China to Africa, from you know, the, the, the Americas. And the idea is that it means uh, to love wisdom, philos, love, 
and wisdom is Sophia. So it is the love of wisdom, or if you want, the wisdom of love. And in a sense, is uh, the reason why I am in this field. It is not just, uh, to me, this is not just a job. I am, we, for you too, we are spending now hours answering all these questions absolutely for free because we care about them. It's not about making any money about the book. Uh, authors uh, get really very small percentage of the money that goes into uh, book selling. So it is not uh, because of that that I'm here today. It is because I am uh, nourished by this conversation. Because when, I, when I'm talking to you, uh, your perspective, your questions, allow me to understand more who I am. Because I, I know, I always knew that I've I never been just myself. I didn't come out of nowhere. I came out of human bodies, uh, human DNA. I am constantly entangled. I'm not even entangled, I am reality. I am the material reality. I need. I, I eat the food that was grown in this earth. I am drinking the water that came from the sky and, and the clouds and the rain and the snow. And I'm breathing the air that has been breathed before by others, not just humans, that is created by the ocean and that my microorganism in the ocean and by the plants. So I would say that what is happening is that a lot of people, uh, I think this is actually a real wave in the human species, are understanding that uh, it is uh, the, the, the dream of being separated that has been supported by anthropocentrism for the last, for sure, 200 years, but you can really expand. Some people say from the beginning of uh, um, civilization. So we can say 5,000 years, or some people go back even to the Neolithic the, with the agricultural revolution. So let's say 11,000 years, but no more than that. So this dream of being separated, where I can grow my food, I can kill non-human animals without acknowledging their existence, uh, thinking of them as a resource, Heidegger would say as a standing reserve where I can just keep taking and taking and taking because it's not alive or because it doesn't have consciousness or because it's just something that is not who I am, it's separated from me. So this idea is, is starting to crumble down. A lot of people are realizing that uh, a lot of diseases that uh, are really serious nowadays are caused by ecological disbalance. Uh, a lot of parents are realizing that their, their, the children, their children are eating food that is uh, no longer what they were eating because there, are, uh, there is microplastic in most of this food. So there is a wave I can really see within my lifetime. When I was uh, probably your age, uh, Manuel, I was very much into human diversity. So I was very interested in, for instance, uh, uh, gender studies, in uh, critical race studies, in, uh, in post-colonial studies, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, I started to realize that there is uh, no diversity if we are not including non-human diversity. And that's when really the whole field of post-anthropocentrism opened for me. And I can see now it's happening what was, you know, 10, 20 years ago in the field of human diversity. Nowadays, everyone, you know, maybe you can still see, of course, sexism and racism, but I would say most people on earth realize that all humans have the rights to exist, that we are all have the dignity to exist, that we all have existential dignity. But many societies are still very anthropocentric and anthropocentrism is still seen as something normal. Now this is changing. You, for instance, can see a movement like the rights of nature in many different countries, a movement that started in 2008 from Ecuador, where, for instance, the rights of nature were recognized in their constitution, connected to the uh, understanding of Pachamama, the earth, as uh, this great mother uh, that is uh, the, uh, the, cycle, the cycle of regeneration of which we are part of. So in that sense, I, I see a difference. There is a change that has been uh, really flourishing the last 10 years. And so academia is part of this change. I would even say academia is one of the motors of this change. A lot of ideas come out of great minds in academia that, has been, that have been dis discussing and reflecting in smaller cir uh, circles 10 years ago, and now it's becoming more and more mainstream, which is really beautiful. The risk of that, which I've been also witnessing, is when we, who are not just social beings, we're also individual beings, when we find peace with our own consciousness uh, by changing nothing in our lives, but just talking about something. So for instance, by me giving a lecture about the six mass extinction, I feel at peace with myself because I feel I'm doing something good for the environment, 
but then I don't do I don't change any of those habits that are actually creating the six mass extinction. Because on some level, I excuse myself because I give my own justification. Ah, but but I did that. That's okay. But that is a justification that is not really uh, that is not uh, that is not real. It is uh, it is a it is an existential obfuscation. And I see that um, in academia, for instance, I give you an example. I give you a personal example. I have been organizing conferences within the posthumanist community for more than 10 years now. Uh, and it has been an amazing uh, opportunity to connect with the uh, community and also see where we are still weak. And uh, this was a while ago. I'm not going to say what conference was, but I'm going to tell you exactly the experience. This was more than 10 years ago. And it was this beautiful conference. I actually was one of the organizers, but I was not one of the local organizers. So if you are not a local organizer, you usually just show up and maybe you've been, you know, choosing the panelists, but you usually are not involved in the food or in the drinks or stuff like that. So I get to this conference. I've been, parenthesis, I've been a vegetarian since I am 15 year old, full on. Uh, I do eat fish sometimes. And I was, uh, I started when I was 12, but full on since I'm 15 year old and 45, 45 now, I think. So I've been 30 years. And so I was at this conference that I actually was co-organizing and it's time to eat. And actually, this was uh, an important dinner. It was the, the first dinner. It was a, a, a party. And it was really beautiful. It was on this boat, on this river, and it was really beautiful. But the only food that was offered was uh, uh, barbecue meat. Uh, there was a very strong fog of uh, cooked meat that I found very upsetting because I've not been eating red meat uh, since, I, since I was 12, and so it's been more than 30 years. There was no food for uh, anyone who would not eat meat. And, and I was one of the organizers. So some of the, and this is a conference about posthumanism. So of course, some people get, got to be very upset and they were vegan and about human rights and animal rights and, uh, and natural rights of nature. Say, so, well, you know, Francesca, what's going on? I, I'm hungry, there's nothing to eat. And I was uh, in the same condition. I had to leave the boat, go to the supermarket and get some, some, I don't know what I got. I think I got some, uh, some hummus and some crackers. And they said, yeah, let's go to the supermarket and, and get something because we are going to be starving. There is nothing for us. But it made me really realize, I, I, you know, it was such an intense moment, especially with all the, the wind. And, and I can see that the organizer put love there. You know, it was a beautiful boat and it would have been, you know, it was nice. It was on a river. But how could, not, how could you not consider at the conference that is about post-anthropocentrism, that is about, you know, we were talking about the rights of nature and how could you just give meat to eat? I'm not saying that no one should eat meat. I'm not generalizing for, for people. I'm not saying what you should be eating because you, you know your body better than I do. I know that I don't eat meat. And I know that this is one of the things that also we've been writing. One of the reasons, my reason is not health. Uh, I, when I was a kid, I did eat meat and I actually enjoyed it. Mine is an ethical point that I've been writing about. And so in, in our community, we know that not everyone eats meat, especially in our community. Some people do not eat meat at all. And so to me, how come that a conference about these topics, the theory is perfect. All these great names talking about uh, non-human nature and spending two hours about this debating should we use the term nature or not. And then it's time to eat dinner and the food that is there, actually the only food because there was not even a second option, is red meat. So it made me really think, and then from there on, I started to really write about the praxis of being posthuman or a prax what possibilities of being posthuman at the practical level, because to me at the point it was no longer possible to just by writing about these things. And then I started to write, you know, when the then theory become practice without saying that there is one way to be posthuman. I want to be very clear about this, but definitely there is no way we can just separate what we talk about, our great lecture in front of the great audience, and then our dinner afterwards altogether. And so to me, it is an existential path. It is not, in my case, I really don't want to generalize this, but in my case, it's not just a job. It is the, my dharma, is what I want to be doing, is what I'm doing, is what also allow me to pay my bills. So there is a real ethical choice in what I'm doing for, for a job. Uh, I wouldn't do just any job. You can make money with anything. You can go in some countries and kill people and making money doing that. So it's not how it's not just the money. It's how do you make your money? And to me, teaching philosophy, it is not just uh, a job. 
because there are many beautiful jobs that you can do with dignity, helping others, but it's not my dharma. And, and when I realized that some people could really just say something and doing the opposite, I realized that I could not judge them, but I could improve on myself being an organizer of the conference and realizing that from there on, we had to talk about the food. We had to talk about the drinks. We had to talk about, for instance, I'll give you one more example. We were organizing an event in Italy, again, posthumanists, I'm not going to go into details because uh, all these people are amazing. They're all volunteers. No one is getting paid in these communities. And so one of the organizers said, let's ask everyone to bring a bottle of wine. And in that region, wine is, is very much loved. There is a really ancient tradition of wine, which is really beautiful. And I said, well, you need to consider that some people, for instance, according to some tradition, uh, you cannot drink alcohol. And it's absolutely funny if you want to bring a bottle and, and having, you know, like having that as an option, but you cannot force everyone coming to this conference to bring a bottle of wine because some people don't drink. Some people maybe come with their own children and they don't, they are not going to be drinking because they don't want to drive with, you know, or they don't want to drive at all drunk because it's not a very good idea. Plus it's illegal in Italy. Uh, and then some people, for instance, thinking of my, uh, of my Muslim friends uh, in Islam, you don't drink alcohol. So that doesn't mean that we should then drink, drink, drunk, drink alcohol. I know that this, to this person, wine was an important, it was part of her roots. She grew up with, with you know, with uh, uh, making wine in, in that area. You know, the, the, the grapes are sacred. Very beautiful, and yes, rec let's recognize that. But let's recognize diversity. How can we do in a way that, yes, we can have some alcohol, and, but we don't have to drink alcohol. Some people may be drinking alcohol, some people may not. How can we understand that we can dignify everyone without thinking that one way is the only way? And so this is to me an open question. And to me, this is why it's so interesting and exciting that the global community is really global. There are groups in Pakistan and in India and in Morocco and in Mexico and in Argentina and in, in the United States and Canada. And, and the beauty for me of this is that they don't have to assimilate themselves. They don't have to, to universalize their practice. They can adapt it to specific needs. I remember being at this beautiful conference in Pakistan. In their case, for instance, they wanted to pray before having a discussion. And so they did pray and then had a discussion and that suited their own tradition and their own culture. And that's beautiful. So I would say, how can we make sure that we are not telling, you know, how this should be done? But how can we make sure that everyone is recognized and dignified? And to me, the only way is leaving spaces for the debate, leaving spaces for posing questions. And this is why, Manuel, I would like to thank you so much not only for being so generous and kind and enthusiastic about uh, the book that is coming out you were the one who said let's do you know let's select let's do the book launch together we've been thinking about this now for for a while it's been uh, a, a journey together uh, but not only that but also being aware that there were questions and there were people and how could we make sure that even if we didn't have time we could allow most people, I know that we didn't address all the questions, and I know that some questions did not get answered. Maybe we will get, we will do that in a possible, but jolly future uh, of a last video of another half an hour. <laughs> but thank you so much for not silencing those voices, because uh, we need to be able to listen, and we need to be able to have moments of debate, especially if this is really an existential journey, and it's not just a job, it's not just another article is not just another certificate, but if this is our life. And to me, posthumanism is a way of existing. And it is my way of existing that doesn't have to be yours, but it is our, it's part of a lotus that is unfolding, it's part of a wave of awareness. So thank you so much, Manuel, Inesh, and all the people who posed these incredible questions, and everyone who has been part of this great journey of the book launch and all these uh, questions and answers that keep going because there are so much energy and, and insights and interest and, uh, and possibilities out there. And we're all in this together. Thank you so much. It is my honor and a great, great joy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Um, I, I think uh, your book uh, really is about these existen existential obfuscations. And uh, I can say that. I was few, I can't say that, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it is about that. And uh, um, I, I really like how you suggest um, a number of meditations. I, I can recall the number 
um, of how we can go through uh, an existential journey um, and uh, learn more about who we are and learn more about the art of, of being post-human. Uh, so this was uh, the last of our three uh, follow-up uh, Q&A uh, videos. Uh, this was on the environment. Um, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for uh, for watching. Thank you again to Francesca, to Inês, to Setups, to um, everyone uh, who's uh, been with us uh, throughout this whole process. Um, and um, Francesca, I, I don't know if you want to uh, say any final words. Um, Manuel, I would like to thank you again so much. Uh, everyone, Ines, uh, also who is doing this incredible job behind it, the editorial aspect of the videos, and all of you who are uh, listening and watching this video today, uh, please keep in mind that you are part of this. P, parenthesis, art. You are art of this. You are part of this. And if there is anything else that really, really you would like to share with us, uh, maybe we can ask Manuel to add a way to contact us in the description of the video. We cannot make any promise because we've been now really, uh, uh, this is actually <laughs> the fourth uh, video on q and A's, but everything is possible. Uh, maybe, you know, in a couple of months from now, we decided maybe there are, uh, uh, there are some questions that need to be addressed again. So we may have uh, one more optional video. So if there is something that really, really you would like to address, please do so, send us uh, an, an email uh, to uh, the um, contact uh, that Manuel and Inesha are going to kindly add in the description of this video. And I also want to mention that uh, after the pandemic, we started again a meeting in person in different locations of the world. I'm actually going to be next week in India. So if you are in the area, I know that the Indian subcontinent is very big, but if you are around Bangalore, do not hesitate to come at Alliance University. Uh, we are going to be in Rome in August 2024 for the World Congress of Philosophy. And after that in Bologna, again, Italy, for the uh, second edition of Posthuman Summer Camp. Everyone is welcome. The, uh, actually, the call for uh, participation is open for the next three days. And then we're going to be in Mexico for uh, the fall. So just keep connected. Uh, there is a, a website, uh, www.posthumans dot org plural post two months and you can connect to our newsletter there it's free you can also promote your own work about posthumanism through the newsletter it reaches more than 1500 international members and if you have any specific uh, questions for me you can uh, connect uh, through my uh, website www.theposthuman.org uh, i would like to say that i read all the uh, questions I may not have the chance to reply to all the emails, but I will have read your email for sure. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Manuel, Inesh, and the whole community, human, post-human, academic, philosophical. And if you are interested, you can read more on this topic, on the art of being post-human, Polity Press, eight chapters that are eight independent meditations on the topic that most, is most appealing to you the art of being post-human. Thank you so much, everyone.